Well, hello again. This is Jack Sheffield, Jack the Exam Guy. We are going to be talking about the Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Technology Manual. This is a manual that you're going to need to be familiar with if you are taking the Air A, the Air B, or the Mechanical Exam. Now, some people, as you get into this stuff, a lot of this stuff applies to larger than 25 tons, so some Air B people, some if you're taking Air B, some people might say, well, you know, how much of this is going to apply to me? Well, you never know. And every school that I know of teaches Air A, Air B, and tech and mechanical all the same, except for mechanical, you just have two extra books. So you just really need to be prepared to answer any anything out of this book regardless. Okay, let's take a look at the actual book itself. Here it is, okay, the ninth edition. I, I would, I would uh, occasionally run into somebody with a different edition. I, I encourage you to have the right edition. All right, I affectionately refer to it as Big Blue because it is big, it is blue, and I don't like to continue to say refrigeration and air conditioning technology over and over again, so I may refer to this book as Big Blue. All right, the first thing that we need to know when we're taking an exam, is we read our question and we say, okay, what book do I go to? That's the first step. What book do I go to? What manual? And so how do we know to go to this manual? Well, first of all, there's going to be a lot of questions out of this manual, just by virtue of the fact that it covers so much information in 1,700 pages that you will definitely be getting a good chunk of your questions out of Big Blue, okay? Um, now, we like to use the term when we talk about this book as engineering, okay? It's a, you know, we'll, we'll read a question and we'll say, okay, it sounds like an engineering question. What does that mean? Well, it's all the info that you're going to need if you're going to build a system, okay? So, it first of all talks about, you know, heat theory, you know, the properties of air, you know, how heat is transferred and so forth. It says latent heat, specific heat, all these different terms and explains, you know, explains these things. You know, and then we it might talk about leak detection. You know, that that's something that you're going to need to be aware of that's in this book. Now, that's also going to be in the troubleshooting manual as well, but, you know, it's going to be here as well. You know, all your different controls that you have. You know, you've got all kind of controls in this business, okay, and your motors and all your refrigerants and all your properties of refrigerant, properties of air, like I mentioned before. And then you're going to get into the bigger stuff like the cooling towers and the chillers you know, and then they're going to talk about the refrigeration cycle, you know, evaporators, condensers, you know, um, expansion valves, compressors, and so forth, anything air conditioning or refrigeration. All right. So you might ask yourself, well, <clears throat> how do I, you know, anything could be in this book. Any question could be in this book. Well, it's almost like a process of elimination. What I want you to realize is that there's going to be a lot of questions that are going to uh, be of such a nature that you realize it's probably not in this book. Probably your safety questions are going to be in the OSHA book. So you're, you're using a process of elimination kind of. Um, you know, your code questions are going to read like code questions. You know, it's got to be, it shall be a certain way. There's going to be minimums and maximums and spaces and this, that, and the other. And you're going to realize, okay, that's a code question. That's not, you know, that's not about the workings of the air conditioning system. Okay, that's more of like where it's got to be placed in the house, you know, or, you know, or like if you're drilling through studs or something like that, you know, what what are the rules there? Okay, that's that's not what this manual is about. Or about, you know, commercial cooking, all right? You know, there you have a commercial cooking book. You've got commercial cooking in your uh, mechanical code book and what have you. You realize that's not going to be in this book, okay? You know, and the stuff for preventing fires, you know, your NFPA stuff, the stuff that's going to be in the NFPA books. Uh, troubleshooting, you could get some troubleshooting questions in here, but, you know, for the most part, your troubleshooting questions are going to come out of your, you know, your troubleshooting guide. So energy uh, questions are probably not going to be in this book. You know, you got your energy code book, you know, and then you've got your energy efficient building construction in Florida. Of course, we got separate videos that take you through those and kind of give you an idea of what's in those manuals. So 
Um, but, you know, so anything that's not going to pigeonhole into something else is going to be in this manual. Hopefully that gave, gives you like a, a kind of an overview of, uh, of what we're doing here. Um, I always like to address the index, all right, because that's going to be the key. Now, I always tell people the first thing you want to do when you find the keyword and you know what book you're going to, use the index. Even as familiar as I am with these manuals, I do this. I, that's, that's where I go when I'm taking an exam. Go to the index. It'll take you to the right page. There's 1,700 pages here. Okay, you're going to need some help from the index. Always use the index. You find your keyword in your, uh, your key kind of word or concept in your question. Go to the index and 80% of the time it'll get you where you need to be. Problem with this, one, one problem is there might be several several references, so you might have to go to a few different places, but you know, it's, it's definitely doable. Okay, the index alone is 40 pages. All right, there's a lot of stuff in this manual. Okay, so it's really important that, uh, that you kind of get familiar with it. Another thing I want to point out in this book is there's a glossary. All right, so you know, a lot of times you'll get a question and it'll, you'll, it'll be obvious that it's like a definition. You know, you know, and and, you know, the glossary, it could be, you know, right there in the glossary. So uh, so keep all that in mind. OK, without further ado, we're going to go, you know, just basically concept by concept as we hit those important ones as we go through the manual itself. The first thing I want you to do is be on page 22 or 23. All right. There is a concept called the latent heat of vaporization. All right, it's the amount of heat energy in BTUs per pound required to change a substance into a vapor. All right, it's got a real simple definition there, and it's on page 22 and 23. And I also, in some of these at the beginning here, I point out in the index where it is. So that's going to be on page 1683 in the index. You can hit that with a highlighter if you want. You know, when you hit the when you when you highlight in the index as well. Sometimes it'll get you, you know, <clears throat> your eye will be drawn to it when you uh, when you go to take this exam. And I got to tell you, time is important. Anything that's going to save you time. OK, and we're going to go to page 24 and we're going to talk about specific heat. All right. Um, we now realize that different substances respond differently to heat. When one BTU of energy is added to one pound of water, it changes the temperature one degree Fahrenheit. This holds true only for water. Other substances have different values. For instance, we note that adding a half of BTU to either ice or st steam causes a one degree rise per pound. The temperature of ice and steam increase at twice the rate of water. That's interesting. Adding one BTU of heat energy to one pound of either ice or steam would result in a two degree Fahrenheit rise. This difference in heat rise is known as the specific heat. It's the amount of heat necessary to raise the temperature of one pound of substance one degree Fahrenheit. That's what you really, really need to know. One pound, one degree. That's the specific heat of a substance. So on page 24, make sure you highlight it. And then you can also highlight it uh, in the index on page 1694, so it's easy to find when you're taking this exam. All right, so we're going to go, um, you may in the future have somebody ask you about a nitrogen tank and a set of nitrogen gauges. All right, um, the last paragraph on page 80 says that nitrogen must have its pressure regulated before it can be used because the pressure of the cylinder is too great to be connected to a system. Okay, we know that. So basically, we have to make sure that we turn it off completely before we hook it to the system. Now, how do we do that? Well, there's a picture of a regulator on the next page. And those of you in the field that work in the field may know this is better than me, but that that main valve there in the middle, I believe if you turn it all the way clockwise, counterclockwise, counterclockwise, that turns that regular off. And that's what you have to do first before you do anything is turn, turn it completely off the regulator so you don't blow the system out, right? Yeah, we all know that. Okay, we're going to jump to something called um, the American uh, Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. So we're on page 93 here. 
And they developed this standard 34. And the standard 34 is for refrigerants. Okay, so page 93, ASHRAE standard 34 is for refrigerant classifications. And if you go to the index under ASHRAE, what you'll find, first of all, is it'll say on page 1668 under ASHRAE, the acronym, it'll say C, American Society of Heating and Refrigeration. So we go over to the previous page, 1667, and there it is, American Society of Heating. And then you drop down. Now, if you don't know this already, these subheadings are important. We've got the main heading, which is American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. And then we have a subheading which talks about refrigerants. Okay, so these, this, this, this standard for refrigerants is right there on page 93. So I've got 93 underlined because that's the page number where they talk about the refrigerant standard for ASHRAE. Okay. Very good. So we're going to go, they have a manometer on page 125. And somebody might ask you someday in the future about 1 PSI. When you have 1 PSI, okay, what's it going to read on the manometer? Well, it's going to read 27.7 IWC. So what does IWC mean? Inches of water column. All right, so keep that in mind. That might come in handy one day. And manometer is on page 1684 in the index. It just says manometer. There you go. Boom. Go to page 125 and 126 and you're on your way to the next question. Okay, now we have on page 188 a standing pressure test. All right, so it says that the under where it says section 18, excuse me, 8.4, the standing pressure test is probably the most frequently used method of leak detection. Okay. And, and then what, what is, um, as you go down below the bullets, it says there's several leak detection procedures. The first test is to charge a trace amount of refrigerant into the system. Most technicians start at zero. Okay, we put Z, we, we put in enough um, trace gas to go up to 10 PSIG, all right? And then the next paragraph says, once the trace refrigerant has been entered, you put the rest in dry nitrogen. Okay, so these are just nice things that you may already know if you work in the field, or maybe you don't know if you don't work in the field. Um, but either way, we can find it because we look in the index under standard pressure test on page six, standing pressure test under 16, page 1695 in the index, it gets us right there to page 188, 189, and boom, we're off to the races again. Okay, we are talking on page 226 about the boiling point. All right, I can see in your future that somebody may say, hey, what is, what refrigerant has a boiling point of negative 28 degrees Fahrenheit? And if you look in the index under B for boiling point, it might take you to page 226 and you got a little chart there. It says, okay, the boiling point minus 28 degrees up. There it is. It's R-717 ammonia. Are you highlighting these? You might want to make sure that you are because you might just see them someday in the future. All right. I'm going to start pointing out. I'm going to stop pointing uh, all of the indexes uh, markings to you, but you can you can look at those. And then at the end of the uh, presentation, I'm going to show you all those as well. So we're going to be on page 238. Now, page 238. You know we're trying to recover and reuse as much of this refrigerant as possible, but you know you can't take, you know, your refrigerant from one equip piece of equipment and put it in another. We just don't do that, right? But there's one, there's, 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 we can reuse the refrigerant under one circumstance, and there it is. That first bullet, we can charge the recovered refrigerant back into the same equipment without recycling it. Okay, we can go straight back into that same piece of equipment. Not one like it, okay, not another one of the same model, not another one of the same manufacturer, but that specific piece of equipment. 
we can put the refrigerant, the same refrigerant we took out, we can put it back in without contaminating another system. Very important. Somebody might ask you that sometime in the future. And that's on page 238. That's that first bullet. All right. We jump over to page 350 and 351. All right. 350 and 351. Make sure that you can find it. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at it in my book while we're at it. Because we're talking about <clears throat> we're talking about water pressure regulators, okay? And um, you might see that I have a note at the bottom that says to condenser. That's what's important. They're talking about the water regulating valve and what does it control? Water to where? And number two, number two on page three fifty one says your water regulating valve controls your water flow to the condenser. Yeah, you might want to make a note of that. And you might want to go ahead and uh, at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll show you exactly where it's at in the index as well. Okay, page 388. All right, page 388. I'm going to flip over to page 388 as well. And we're looking at this thing called the pilot positioner. All right. So we're 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 looking at we're going to start reading. Okay, we're actually talking about you know your typical kind of air compressor here. Okay. If you look if you look on the previous page, you'll say okay, we're just this this is this is pretty much a standard air compressor that we're talking about. And it, and I want you to read this very carefully at the top of page 388. It's the first full sentence. The valve is the controlled device. The pneumatic device is the controller, controlled by the sensor. This high air volume valve may be located some distance from the room thermostat. A device called a pilot positioner is used to control the large volume of air. The pilot positioner receives the signal from the thermostat and regulates the air pressure to the air cylinder, which modulates the water valve anywhere from fully closed to fully open. Okay, the pilot positioner uses main air pressure, main air pressure, 20 psig, to move an air cylinder piston. This piston is held in a retracted position by a coil spring within the air cylinder body and the shaft can only be moved with air pressure on the opposite side of the diaphragm. All of this is good. You have to really be careful and understand what is the controlled and what is the controller. We read this very carefully if somebody were going to ask you about this in the future. Okay, we're going to go to page, jump all the way to page 526. All right, and it says air cooled condensers. Air cooled condensers on page 526. They have a relationship to the temperature of the air passing over them, much like an evaporator in the previous unit. For instance, the refrigerant inside the coil will normally condense at 30 degrees Fahrenheit, higher temperature than air passing over it. This is true for more standard efficiency, condens standard efficiency condensers that have been in service long enough to have a typical dirt deposit on the fin fins and tubing. Efficiency can be improved by adding condenser surface area. Okay, so what I want you to realize here is let's say somebody said, you know, the air is bypassing the condenser. What happens when the air just bypasses the condenser? It's not really getting through the condenser like it should. Will that increase or decrease the de efficiency? Will it increase or decrease the efficiency of this air cool condenser? In my opinion, something like that going on is going to decrease the efficiency. What about you? You feel the same way? I imagine so. Might want to make a note of that. And then we're going to go to page 567. All right, let's jump over the page, page 567. We're talking about a, a, a two-step capacity control for a scroll compressor. Okay, so this is a compressor. We're probably going to look this up under compressors. All right. And 
it's really the last paragraph that we're talking about. As mentioned earlier, okay, the internal DC solenoid and the compressor that operates the internal unloading mechanism is energized by the second stage of the conditioned space thermostat. It's expected that the majority of run hours will be at low capacity. It is in this mode that the solenoid is de-energized. This allows the two-stage thermostat to control capacity through the second stage of the thermostat in both cooling and heating. Okay, you might want to take a note of that. And we are going to, you might want to just look at the top of page 560. I actually don't have this on the slide, but it does have, it does have your little assembly up there um, in this figure 23.52, an internal unloading mechanism showing modulating ring and solenoid coil assembly. This is your, this is really your control valve there. Okay, let's move along. 598, you have something called an automatic expansion valve. You just look under A. Once you get a question about an automatic expansion valve, you just go to the index under A for automatic. It gets you to page 598, and you go, wow, there it is. The automatic expansion valve maintains constant pressure in the evaporator. Okay. The superheat is not mentioned. There you go. That's all you really need to know about the automatic expansion valve there on page 598. And then we can jump, take a pretty big jump to 1024. Most of us are going to know that information on 1024. We've been doing this long enough to know that ultraviolet light is the type of light that's going to be in a filter, right? In a light filter. It's ultraviolet light. Yep, it's right there on that page. I don't actually have it highlighted there on the screen, but you can find it all over that page. Not that you're actually going to even need to go there when you get that question. Ultraviolet is going to be what you're going to want to hit. 1024 is that page. Okay. 1047 is the next page that I want you to take a look at. This is going to be an important page for you because you can be sure that you're going to get at least one question off the psychrometric chart. All right, there's going to be a totally different video that's going to take you through the psychrometric chart. So I, um, I'm not going to go over it in detail right now, but you do need to um, understand uh, where to find it. Because this is, you're not allowed to bring a separate psychrometric chart in, but you've got one here that you can read. All right. And if you flip over to the next page on page 1048, it actually tells you how to plot the thing. So this is important. If you get here and you forget that the wet bulb is diagonal and the dry bulb is, is vertical and that the relative humidity goes at a, you know on the curved lines. Well, it tells you right there on page 1048 how to plot everything, so that can help you out as well. So, but like I said, there's a separate video which we're going to go into much greater detail about how to use that psychrometric chart. Page 1097 is interesting. All right, it's, the question doesn't actually come off. Uh, the question that I'm asking you doesn't actually come off of page 1097, but it, 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 it's, a, it's an interesting um, diagram because sometime in the future while you're working, you may come across a diagram like this where you've got a fan and you've got the duct work and then you've got your places where your you know your vents are and somebody might ask you what is the fan output well they'll have all this information there like your static pressures your in input static your output static and so on and so forth and all of a sudden you start scratch your head like oh boy there's a formula here well it's a whole lot easier than it looks because each one of these outlets tells you it has how many CFMs are supposed to come out of it. So you know all you have to do is just add up all the CFMs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that's what the fan output has to be. It's much easier than it actually looks. Okay. We are going to go to water to water heat pumps on page 1339. Okay. 
printer. There's a pretty good explanation of water to water heat pumps here on page 1339. And what I really want you to know about about these water to water heat pumps, you know, they use a well. And in that paragraph C is what you really like to know. When water is used by the heat pump, all right, this is this is right there at the top underneath that uh, little uh, little diagram. The pressure in the air charge pushes the water into the system. The pump stays off. Ah, the well pump only comes on when the pressure strip closes on a drop in the pressure. So the question is, on startup, what what will not necessarily turn on? Yeah, the well pump, the pump. Yeah, 1339 is the page that's on. That's a little nugget for you. Okay, we're going to jump over to page 1480. Let's jump over to page 1480 and see what kind of jewel we have here. 1479, 1480. <clears throat> okay, now this is going to begin a section about chillers. They also also call chilled water systems or chillers. When you look in the index, it's going to be under chilled water systems. Okay, so be aware of that. So we are looking at something called the concentrator segment. Okay. It says here at the top on page 1480 that figure 47.53 shows the concentrator and condenser segment. Okay. All right. And you can look at that if you like, get an idea what they're talking about. But as we go to the right hand column, it says figure 47.53. Dot 55 shows a heat exchange between the dilute and the concentrated solution. This exchange serves two purposes. It preheats the dilute solution before it enters the concentrator and precools the concentrated solution before it enters the absorber section. You just might need to access this section at some time in the future when somebody might ask you about the concentrator segment of a chilled water system or chiller as they call it okay that's on page 1480 we're going to jump over to page 1500 there's a couple of things on page 1500 that i want you to be aware of all right now we're still we're talking about a cooling tower here okay we're talking about a cooling tower and on page 1500 on the left hand side at the top about 10 lines down from the top the sentence says cooling towers produced for HVACR applications are typically designed to operate with a seven degree approach temperature a cooling tower's approach temperature is the temperature difference between the water leaving the tower and the wet bulb temperature of the outside air entering the cooling tower. I guarantee you that's going to be a hot topic sometime in your future. Okay, as we go down that same column though, I want you to find in, 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 in highlighted in blue something called the tower range. Okay, it's typically about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the tower range. All right. But some people use the term cooling range. All right. Instead of tower range, or the cooling range is the decrease in temperature. Okay. So just keep in mind cooling range and tower range might be two terms that are somewhat interchangeable. It's just cooling re re refers to the decrease in temperature and not decrease and increase. Okay, just a little nugget of information for you. Okay, we're going to jump over to, we're still talking about cooling towers, and I want you to find the one at the top of page 1505. The one at the top of page 1505 is pulling air, dry air in from the sides and pushing moist warm air out the top and if you look at the top of that little diagram 
it says figure 48.16 this is a cross flow cooling tower cross flow all right you've got counter flow as well any one that either one of these is going to be fair game on the exam but uh, there you go and we're going to jump over to page 1509 and 1510. Okay, so apparently um, in these cooling towers, okay, and these chilled water systems, there is, there is a loss of water. And the book tells us there's three reasons, all right? Um, and it's going to be important for you to know where to find them. And on the bottom of page 1509, on the left-hand side at the bottom, it talks about makeup water. It says, because the cooling tower operates on evaporation, water is constantly lost from the system. So water evaporates, that's one. It's also lost from the cooling tower because of drift, that's two. And then we flip over to page 1510, and it's blow down. Okay, blow down, as if you look, read the bold print there must be managed correctly because if not correctly implemented monitor the potential for losing large amounts of water down the drain is hot so it's blow down drift and evaporation keep that in mind all right moving right along okay well that's going to get us to all the way to the glossary and i mentioned the glossary earlier glossary is very important probably three questions out of the glossary alone and you know there's going to be definition questions you should be able to, able to identify a definition question you know okay they're just asking you know you know it's basically you know what is you know specific heat basically and then you have to just look it up and it's not uh, it's actually fairly self-explanatory you may have to look it up in the index and go to the actual somewhere in the text but you i suspect you're going to use this uh, glossary for at least at least two or three so it starts on page 16 14. i want you to realize it is in uh, uh, the black print um, is english and then you've got the term in blue which is in spanish maybe that'll help you out if spanish is your first language okay and then you've got uh page uh, 1623 i've got conduction highlighted heat transfer from one molecule to another within a substance or from one substance to another i want you to realize and this is also in one of the other manuals that, that you'll see um in the energy systems analysis and management manual but they also talk a lot about uh, heat transfer in that manual but heat transfer through a solid wall that's conduction okay it doesn't actually say solid wall here it does in the other manual but i just want to make sure that you're aware of that okay very good so conduction you know heat transfer through a solid wall is called conduction all right and then i've got something on page 1641 which is also in the glossary highlighted and that oh all of these on the left hand side they're not actually highlighted but but all this stuff about latent heat of condensation latent heat of fusion latent heat of vaporization you know all these latent heat you know just the definition of latent heat all that is fair game so be prepared for it 1657 is our next um place that we're going to see something in its specific heat i want you to find specific heat we already talked about that you might even have that memorized by now amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a of one pound of substance one degree fahrenheit okay I guarantee you if you get a question like that one of the choices is going to be one degree celsius and that's going to be wrong it's one degree fahrenheit all right so now we go to the index I like to point the things out in the index that you can highlight because hey, that's just going to make it that much quicker for you on your exam. Okay, so you have on page 1666, you've got air-cooled condenser. We already talked about that. Page 1667, the American Society of Heating Refrigeration uh, uh, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And you, we, we, uh, we were talking about the refrigerants, which was, do you remember which one? Ashray what? What number? 34. You know, if you can remember some of these, 
That might just be the difference of you actually getting over the hump. Um, that was 1667. We go to 1668 and we have approach temperature. Okay. That's actually kind of a kind of a hard one to remember. You're going to want to make sure you look that up because it's talking about wet bulb in there as well. So you have your approach temperature, you have your cooling tower um, there. That's where you find the answer. You have ASHRAE. All right, which takes you through, uh, which take, which actually refers you back to American society. You have to actually spell it all out. They got it spelled all out. Um, you have automatic expansion valve. We talked about the automatic expansion valve, right? And then on page 1669, we have boiling point. That's that negative 28 degree Fahrenheit boiling point for what? Ammonia? Yeah. Okay. All right. We flip over to page 1670 and we see chilled water systems. You're going to want to make sure you can find that, especially if you're doing air A or mechanical. Air B, possibly as well. Never count yourself out. You still still might be you still might 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 be responsible for that. You never know who's writing these test questions. They may not really understand. They may not be experts in this field and they may not understand about what should be on an air A and what should be on an air B. So keep that in mind. Okay, so we're going to be on page 1672, and you've got under cooling tower, you've got your blow down. We talked about that. You've got your flow patterns. We talked about that. Remember the air coming in from the side and out through the top is what? What type? Did you say cross flow? I hope so. And then you have that tower range under cooling tower, which is also can be used, the term can be used, cooling range. All right, keep that in mind. And you're getting some good info here today, I gotta tell you that. All right, we're gonna jump over to page 1683. At 1683, we have the latent heat of vaporization. All right, page 2223. And then we go to 1684. We see the manometer on page 125, 124. Remember what one, one, one PSI, wasn't that 27.7 inches of water column? Hmm. Look that up. Make sure that you can find that. That's going to be important. All right. And then we go to page 1686. 1686, we have the nitrogen cylinders, left-hand column about halfway down. Remember the nitrogen cylinder? You had to turn that, you had to turn that gauge all the way off before you hooked it up. All right, you got it. That's going to be the first step is to turn that turn that joker off. 1688, the pilot positioner. All right, yep. There you go. That has to do with that uh, that air compressor system there. Yep, the pilot positioner. Yep. And we're going to go to 1690 and jump all the way to page 1690, and it says refrigerant recovery and recycling. All right, remember that's the one where you can. If you take the refrigerant out, you can put it back in the exact same unit, nothing else <clears throat> before recycling. And then we go to page 1694, I'm going to jump all the way to page 1694, and we're talking about specific heat. Yeah, well, we know what specific heat is, or at least we know where to find it. Okay, it's also in the glossary as well, but we can go to page 24 and find that. And 1695, standing pressure test, okay, you know, remember that, remember we talked about that, you put about 10, about 10 PSI of your refrigerant, and then you're going to fill the rest of it with dry nitrogen, right? Okay, very good, very good, very good. And believe it or not, that takes you to page 1700. I don't know if I've ever seen, hardly ever see a book with 1700 pages, and you think they could have broken it up a little bit for us, but no. Okay, you have what they call two things here, your water regulating valve. Okay, so keep that in mind, your water regulating valve. Now, I've got the 350 and 351 underlined. It might, if you do that, it might keep you from having to bounce around. Okay, if you were to 342, you know, so, so what have you. So, so I would go to page three. If you get a question about a water regulating valve, I'd go to 351, 350, 351 first. And then we're going to go to the water to water heat pump at the top right. 
And um, and that's where what does not automatically turn on when the system starts up. Do you remember that? That's the well pump. Okay, so there's you've just gotten a lot of good information about the let's just call it big blue because it's also called refrigeration and air conditioning technology, and that's the ninth edition. You have been listening to another installment of Jack the Exam Guy, and you're going to make a killing once you pass this exam. So I want to, I want you to be aware that there's people out there that need your help, and it wouldn't hurt to, you know, donate a little bit of that big money that you're going to make to charity. All right, there's lots of good ones out there, and um, I encourage you to do so. I wish you the best. You can call me at 904. 755-4111 anytime if you have any questions at all. Thank you so much for listening.